Click the Book Fairs tab on our website, booktv.org. Yeah, way. a little bit, yeah. Could you move slightly to the left? <laughs> He's very good-natured. Thank you, that's perfect, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you all so much for uh, coming out tonight. I'm Lisa Muscatine. I'm one of the co-owners of Politics and Prose. My husband and co-owner, Brad Graham, is right there. And uh, we hope that by the end of this event, you will not be stuck here in a snowstorm. Um, we're pretty confident you will get out okay, um, but we're delighted to have all of you here. Uh, before we get started, I think many of you have been to events here. Just a few housekeeping reminders. If you have a noise-making device uh, and can silence it now, we would be grateful for that. Um, the way this will work is that our guests will be in conversation for uh, a bit, and then they'll be happy uh, to take questions from the audience. Uh, we do have a microphone set up right here. We really would love it if you would make it to the mic so that uh, we can record the questions and... Um, that would be very, very helpful. At the end of the event, there will be a signing at this table. If you would be kind enough to fold up your chairs and put them to the side, it will expedite uh, the signing and it will expedite uh, your being able to get through it and out of here and it will also make our staff very happy at the end of a long day, so we appreciate that. And then I just want to say that uh, this is our first week of events for 2017. We have an incredible calendar. Um, coming up, we really urge you to look at our website and also if you would like a, a hard copy of our January calendar, it's up at the information desk and also in the front of the store. Lots of really good stuff coming up. And one of the things we're most excited about is that we are launching, I think uh, some of you may know if you read our newsletter and our emails, we are launching a series of teach-ins uh, this month that we expect to be ongoing through the winter, uh, ranging um, across a variety of subjects really to try to educate and inform people uh, about some of the challenges our country is facing, some of the issues that are going to be on the forefront in the next months and potentially years. And um, hopefully also if you have an interest in a particular issue or a cause to give you some ideas and guidance as to what you can do as an individual or as part of a group to help make progress on those particular issues. This, this Sunday is our kickoff at 2 30, 230, I think. Um, it's going to be on civil liberties and civil rights. We have an incredible panel coming. Uh, David Cole, the executive director of the ACLU. Uh, Mike Waldman, who was the chief speechwriter for Bill Clinton, but is now the head of the Brennan Center uh, in, at New York University Law School and the author of many books about uh, voting rights and the Constitution. And Todd uh, Cox from uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So we're really excited about having those guys. They're all phenomenal experts on this, and we look forward to seeing hopefully some of you and many more people on Sunday afternoon. Uh, we'll also be doing one on women's rights on January 20th at 4 p.m. Um, you can look at the website for more details on that, and we'll have uh, some more upcoming things. And lastly, we do have a display of books recommended for those teach-ins. If you're interested, it's up at the front of the store. I'm done with that, with that part. Now for what you're actually here for. Uh, I can't say what an honor um, and delight it is to host um, Ambassador Omar Saif Gobash tonight here at Politics and Prose. Uh, I think some of you know he's the United Arab Emirates Ambassador to Russia as he's assumed the position in 2009 at the ripe old age of 37. Um, but I was thinking about this today, going through uh, sort of learning more about him. To think of him solely as a diplomat and even one in such an important post is uh, to understate his many wide-ranging wide interests and good works. In addition to representing his country overseas, he's also now an author. Uh, that much I think you already know because he's going to be speaking tonight about his new book. It's called Letters to a Young Muslim, and I'll get back to his book in a second. But first, just a, a brief mention of some of his other experiences and projects. Um, Ambassador Gobash read law at Balliol College, Oxford, earned an advanced degree in math at the University of London, and went on to found several legal and financial companies, open an art gallery, and launch educational projects focusing on the promotion of Arab literature. He was the driving force that led to the creation of a campus of New York University in Abu Dhabi. Uh, perhaps my favorite part of his resume, I hope you don't mind this, is that he spent five years uh, trekking in Nepal and Switzerland, experiencing nature to the fullest as a climber of very tall peaks. Um, all of these experiences, including fluency in four languages, and most important of all, his role and responsibilities as a father of two sons, Saif and Abdullah, are at work in his writing of letters to a young Muslim. 
The book is a collection of missives written to his own children. His effort, he says, to show them, and I quote, how to be faithful to Islam and its deepest values, as well as to see how to chart their way through a complex world. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you note that the book is written for your children, uh, but also with young Muslims, um, uh, young men and young women uh, in mind. And I might suggest, if, if you don't mind, that this book also ought to be required reading for non-Muslims, too. Um, I think anyone who reads it will gain uh, tremendously from your view that people of all backgrounds have, again, to borrow your words, a duty to think and question and engage constructively with the world. Um, those are wise words from a wise man and, of course, so very poignant at this moment in our own country. So thank you for that. Um, we're also very pleased to have with us Marcus Broccoli. He'll be in conversation with Ambassador Gobash this evening. Uh, I think some of you know Marcus from his uh, various uh, roles here in D.C. He was executive editor of The Washington Post and now runs a small investment company um, on media and media technology. Uh, so, Marcus, thank you so much for being here, too. We're really uh, delighted to have you both, and you've got the floor. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight on a, on a cold Washington night. Um, Omar, I don't know if you know this, but normally in Washington, if we got a dusting of snow, they shut the schools and close the government, <laughs> and the roads are a chaos, so we narrowly avoided disaster. Um, it's, it's a great honor to be here um, with Omar for the reasons Lisa said. He is, he is a deeply thoughtful man um, who's courageous in his thinking. And by that I mean we live in a time which, as you all know, uh, politics are deeply polarized. Um, people get arrested, jailed, and worse for thinking thoughts that don't converge with the mainstream. Um, and Omar in this, in this maelstrom stands out for his willingness to take nuanced and original positions on flashpoint issues of our time. Um, one of the things that Lisa didn't mention, which I think is, is highly relevant in understanding uh, Omar's worldview, is that he was born, uh, very much born into this, the early days of the world that we're living in today. He was born in 1971, which was the year that his country, the United Arab Emirates, was founded. So he's grown up. Um, as the region has modernized, he's grown up in that region. His father, who was the foreign minister of the UAE, was assassinated in 1977 when he was six. And I think that searing experience, as much as anything, um, if you read this book, clearly informs um, his awareness of the intolerance and violence of Islamic radicalism. And his personal exploration following his father's death as an Arab uh, as a Muslim and eventually father to two young sons, I think really shapes this narrative in this book. And so what I thought I would do is maybe just start off by asking you to talk about how you came to write this book, what motivated you, and what you're trying to accomplish with it. Because you know we were just talking before we came out here about how this is not a theological treatise. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more than that. And, in, and it's in some ways, I think for the world, the larger world, Lisa was talking about, for those of us who are not Muslim to read it, uh, it's important for bringing understanding to an area of the world and to a religion that's become so central to our political experience. Well, um, <clears throat> thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a great honor to be here. Uh, as I, I told um, uh, the owners before, uh, that this I shall. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so uh, you didn't hear any of that. I'll start again. Um, this is my favorite bookstore in D.C., uh, and it's, I think, one of the last standing bookstores in the world. Uh, if, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's really a great honor to be here uh, tonight. Um, there, there are a couple of things that I think uh, uh, need to be clarified. Uh, I haven't written a theological text. I'm not putting forward a particular theological position. Uh, and in fact, you know, I was asked by um, some key figures in the Middle East whether I had checked with religious scholars on the, uh, uh, the appropriateness of what I'm saying. And I, actually, I, I responded by saying, uh, I'm actually writing uh, in spite of them and, and to take a position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the religious scholars. I'm not asking for uh, religious scholars to tell me that I'm on the right track or not. Uh, so I'm not talking directly about uh, doctrine or prescriptions. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, I'm, I'm ed advising my son uh, and my, my, my two sons to perhaps think about taking a particular position on the world. 
even before they begin to think about uh, the, the particular text of the religion that, that uh, they belong to. Uh, and that, that's a position that I haven't really heard uh, being discussed. And, and that, that idea came out of the uh, realization that uh, there are converts uh, coming into Islam um, and they seem to have solved a problem that Muslims haven't solved. They know which one is the right path. So they know which, that in, in particular cases, they will choose Sufism over Su uh, Sunni Islam over Shia Islam. And the puzzle for me is how on earth did they come to the conclusion that one particular branch of Islam is the true Islam? Uh, and so what I tried to do was take a step back and say, you know, what is informing a convert's decision? Uh, and in a sense, uh, being a Muslim in today's world where we have so much information about competing sects, we're all in the same position. Why would I stand up and say, I'm a Sunni as opposed to being a Shia? Uh, and the real reason is, is because I was educated, brought up, born into a Sunni family and brought up as a Sunni family. Uh, but that's chance, that's not doctrine, that's not persuasion. So what I wanted to do was to, to, to pull back from there and say where are the common elements that seem to uh, combine uh, or, or underlie everything from the peaceful uh, spiritual side of uh, Islam, which is uh, Sufism, all the way to uh, the violent, aggressive, uh, you know, animalistic ISIS, which I also believe is, is a certain kind of expression of Islam. An inappropriate one, uh, an, an illegitimate one, but nevertheless, it really does come from the, the, the source documents. Um, and so uh, the only way in which I could kind of uh, come up with an understanding of how to be a Muslim today is to come back to something fundamental, our, our humanity, uh, and, and to say that actually our humanity is what informs our reading. Uh, and if you are finding for some strange reason that all of a sudden the Quran permits you to, to rape, uh, to enslave, to, uh, to, to rob, uh, to kill, then there's something wrong with you. Uh, yeah, and, and you haven't, you, it's, it's just too much of a coincidence that you as a young male thug have found a religion that actually supports your positions and your, and your instincts and passions. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to say, is that before you come to the text, you need a position on life in the first place. Okay, well, let's, I've run out of uh, energy on that. Let, <laughs> but let me take you back to the, the title of the book and the approach you take to the book, which is you're writing it as a letter, as, letter, as a series of letters and missives to your son or to your sons. Why did you take that approach? And you know, you're clearly trying to help them to understand a lot more than you know, these divisions between Sufism and other strains of Islam. You're, you're taking on the, sort of the whole underpinnings of, of the religion and saying you mustn't be rigid about it. And can you talk a little bit about why you, why you took this particular framework and what are you, what are you trying to accomplish with it? Sure. Uh, to be honest, um, I was never really interested in taking the personal approach. Uh, uh, and if you read the book, you'll see that it is actually very personal. Um, I had written a, what I tried to, to, to I tried to write a, a more of a manifesto, a kind of a, a, a set of uh, guidelines uh, for young people to think about. Um, and it was more of a, uh, attempting to be more of an academic understanding of, of uh, these questions. Uh, and my publisher said it was all great, but very few people would read it. Uh, and so, uh, I'll tell you honestly, they suggested that I think in terms of a series of letters. Uh, and so I rewrote the book entirely uh, between, I think it was March, April, May. March and, yeah. So over the course of two months, um, I used the, 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 the tool of addressing my older son, and it was remarkable that it actually released a tremendous amount of uh, energy. Uh, and I was able to write uh, you know, continuously. And actually, there's a lot of, uh, there are many letters that were not actually included uh, in the final version. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's where that came from. I can't claim that it was my idea. Um, but uh, now, that, now that I've written it, it, it feels like I'm doing you know, sort of public therapy sessions for myself, working through the issues of my childhood. <laughs> but you're also doing sort of, in a sense, public therapy for your religion. And I've heard, I've heard an idea enunciated a number of times in, in the U.S. that Islam is in need of a reformation, a Martin Luther. Mm. Is, in, in reading your book, I sort of come away feeling like that's what you're arguing for, that there needs to be a reformation, a, a changed understanding of what Islam is. Is that yeah. fair? Well, uh, no, I don't think it is fair, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, you know, people have asked me, is the, are you calling for reform of Islam? Uh, that, that suggests that there is some kind of fixed body of doctrine that we can actually look at and debate and then some kind of top-down 
uh, uh, instruction is, is given and we've reformed it. I'm actually, um, I'm, I'm taking a much more modest position. Uh, I'm, uh, to, to ask for reform of Islam would suggest that I have some kind of theological, uh, deep theological understandings. Um, but the reality is all I'm asking for is, is, is clarity. Clarity from the religious scholars who, um, you know, traditionally have uh, held the respect um, uh, in, in our Islamic uh, Muslim societies. And what I'm saying is that, you know, uh, I think we should be I sh we should be asking the clerics to come towards their, their flock uh, uh, and to actually uh, learn about the people that they're guiding and to, to perhaps understand that uh, the flock has changed from the 10th century when most of us were illiterate uh, and today in the 21st century when every one of us has access to incredible amounts of, of information and knowledge. Um, I think also that the clerics, uh, they, they have a sort of very specialized uh, area of expertise. Uh, the, uh, what I'm asking them to do is to really think more broadly about the moral uh, questions that each of us faces in multicultural societies. It's no longer the homog uh, homogeneous society of 7th century or 10th century uh, Arabia. Um, uh, it's very dangerous, I think, to continue with the categories of uh, uh, believer, non-believer, friend or foe, uh, in, uh, uh, insider, outsider, uh, especially when, you know, you're bumping into all kinds of people all day long. Um, so I would like um, for this to be the start. I mean, this would be a dream situation. If this was the start of potentially a, a, a set of dialogues across a Muslim society between, um, between the clerics who really have uh, are the repository of our moral knowledge, and, and youth who are the ones who are really asking the questions uh, and for there to be a kind of, not a meeting of minds, but at least uh, an, an expression of interest in each other to find out you know, what each can contribute to the great moral questions of the Middle East in particular, but to the Muslim world in general. So what does it take to get that dialogue going? I mean, obviously in the US these days, I think there's a lot of concern about Islam and extremism and Islam. Um, and I think that the U.S. would, the U.S. and people in America would generally share the view that it would be great if if Islam could be a religion that was more focused on a modern multicultural society and not a not focused so much on a seventh or eighth century um, view of utopia and a caliphate. What does it take to get that dialogue going? What does it take to get Islam to modernize in the way that you write about in this book? Um, well, one of the things I think is um, really important is the, the, the position of uh, Muslims in America. Um, Muslims in America have the, the protections of the law. Uh, they have uh, an expectation that they can f speak freely. This is very different from many Muslim countries where there is the idea that we need to uh, um, put in blasphemy laws. Um, blasphemy laws are, are, you know, they're very interesting because they seem to be uh, structured to end all debate. Um, and. Uh, you, you have to make sure that you get on the right side of that blasphemy law. Um, I think that the Muslims of America, the Muslim communities of America, um, should really take advantage of the situation here, um, uh, the academic freedom, the intellectual freedom, to really begin to take a lead on uh, the, the um, direction of global Islam uh, and to really contribute to the debate that's taken place in, in the Middle East and in the Arabic language. Um, the ideas can form here and can then be um, uh, kind of propagated. Yeah? And I'm not saying that these are ideas that, that are, uh, are, are reforming or modernizing they are really providing clarity. So, for example, um, I, I talk about the, the role of the Muslim individual. Um, I, I got some criticism by somebody on, on, online uh, where they said that the individual is a Western concept uh, and therefore is not legitimate and shouldn't be brought into the dialogue about Islam. Um, and I, I, I noted the, to myself that the, the person had used Facebook, which is uh, you know, a Western tool, uh, or, or <laughs> maybe that's an, uh, not the appropriate term. Uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's a product of, of Western uh, uh, society. Um, he, he was writing in English and he was writing as an individual. He didn't have a group behind him. And so I thought these are basic concepts that we need to work out uh, uh, and, and to think about. Um, I also think it's, it's, it's interesting that we have this focus on the group uh, uh, and that the idea of the individual is threatening to the group. Um, I actually think that they complement each other. And at the moment, the focus has been too much on the group, which has formed this kind of, uh, it's, a, it's almost an empty body built of, of uh, m many people with, with little personality. Uh, and so I want to raise the level of the quality of the group by uh, um, it, it sort of beefing up the individual in the, in the Muslim world. 
So related to that, there, there are two interesting, there are many interesting elements to your book. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd like you to talk about. One is your view of an understanding of women in Islam. And you, you write in the book how you have an older sister, I guess, who is, um, you describe her in, in very impressive terms. Um, and the way you write about women and you, the role you think they should play in Islam is not, I would say, the conventional understanding um, probably of an American audience of what women in Islam could expect. Can you talk a bit about how you think women should be treated in Islam? Should be treated? <laughs> no, I'm sorry, should. That's, that's, that, that reflects a bias. Let yeah. me rephrase that. <laughs> You know what I mean. Yeah, I know what I know what you mean. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, yeah, well, we, we have um, a whole bunch of patriarchal communities in, in, in the Middle East in particular. And I worry sometimes that uh, in the um, spread of Islam, uh, we're actually uh, exporting some of the um, local cultures and practices uh, of, the, of, of the Middle East. And I'm not sure um, that's a, a great idea, nor do I think it's particularly um, uh, it's, it's particularly appropriate. Uh, there's, I, I can speak from you know, the perspective of an Emirati where women are given all kinds of freedoms, uh, um, by which I mean they're, they're, they're given equal freedoms to, to, to males. Um, and actually, in practice, what that means is that women have the chance to really uh, prove themselves and, and do, a, in fact, they do a much better job than uh, the males in our society. Um, I think we are now more worried about where our men are going and what they're doing with their time. Um, they, they, they seem to have a certain kind of uh, uh, sort of set of expectations that are completely unreasonable. Uh, and so in, in that sense, I think um, certain societies within the Middle East are pushing forward on um, kind of women's rights and, and uh, women's empowerment, really. Um, in the Emirates, we have a, a whole bunch of uh, cabinet ministers who are, are women, and they are, I mean, they're doing an amazing job. They're m much more interesting than the male members, if I, I can say. Um, yeah, my, my sister, uh, she essentially brought me up and uh, she, uh, uh, she has that kind of control over me that uh, only an older sister can have. Um, often uh, you'll hear in the rhetoric of the, uh, certain clerics uh, that women are emotional, they are weaker than men and they're unable to make decisions. So I, I enjoy mountain climbing and my uh, guide, mountain climbing guide, is a, a Swedish woman who's about 5'3", and my life is in her hands. I trust her ent entirely. I've fallen from, uh, from my position uh, and, and hung in the air knowing that she is actually uh, controlling the rope and making sure that I don't fall to my death and pull her with me, of course. Um, so that, that, that's important. I think we need to think in terms not just of, uh, you know, and this is something I've also spoken about. We have this idea that m moral, moral perfection took place in, uh, in the seventh century. Uh, and there is a prophetic tradition to say that the first three generations of Muslims were the, perfectly, uh, the, the, the perfect uh, form of, of Muslim uh, in, 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 through all time. I want to introduce the idea maybe, uh, or at least start a discussion about what it means to be morally perfect or morally excellent as a Muslim in the 21st century. And I have difficulty understanding how we can do that if we are using a set of concepts based in the seventh century. Uh, are we not allowed to develop these concepts? This is a question I put to the clerics. Um, the way we, we describe the world through the seventh century lens, or, or, or going even further through the legitimate line of authorities up until the 10th or the 11th, maybe the 13th century, uh, it makes me wonder whether uh, we're on the right track. And I had a very interesting kind of uh, I, I was very interested by the, um, the, the, the talk around uh, the uh, religious scholar Hamza Yusuf uh, recently where he was asked about Black Lives Matter and he was kind of disparaging and he, he, his analysis of Black Lives Matter was came, came, boiled down to, in my understanding, uh, about the way in which African Americans um, raise their families and their commitment to uh, uh, responsibilities and commitment to family life and their inability to do that. Uh, he made it a, a kind of a moral, personal issue. And then the, the, a lot of criticism was directed at him uh, because he wasn't taking into account structural matters, structural racism and injustice. And I thought to myself, well, this is a great opportunity. He didn't say those are un unacceptable categories. He said, I'm sorry, I, miss, I, I didn't think of those things. So these are concepts that have come from outside of the, um, kind of the, the, uh, the concepts that have uh, come out of Islam. And I thought, well, this is a fantastic opportunity to, to begin to 
um, look at our own reactions and to realize that actually we recognize structural injustice, even though it was never in the Quran and it was never a part of uh, Islamic uh, kind of theology. I have no idea if I answered your question, but... Uh. <laughs> there was an excellent answer in there. Um, <laughs> yes. And let, the, the other thing, I'm, I'll ask one more question, then I'll open up, because I'm sure there are many, many questions from the room. Um, but from the book, that I found quite interesting. You talk, you talk about silence in the book, and how, if I understood it correctly, religion imposes a kind of silence on people. Acceptance of the, of the religious dogma imposes a kind of silence, and... and um, non-thinkingness yeah. on people, and you talk about your own your own youth, and there was a period in your own youth when you were weighing what direction to go, and you fell into the sway of of sort of more dogmatic religion. You talk about how you think, particularly with reference to other young people and young men, particularly at this time, how that plays out, and then how you think that gets ended. Okay, well, I, I picked up on the silence issue, um, so I'm going to start from there. Uh, yeah, at around 15, I decided that I really didn't have any opinions anymore because it was so difficult uh, to reconcile um, you know, having, having a Russian mother, uh, but, uh, but having fairly um, strict, rigid, uh, dogmatic uh, views of, of uh, the world through uh, Islam at the time. At, at, at the time, I was about 14, 15. Uh, and so I decided to leave, uh, and I, I took a, a time out of about 20 years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> three, three of those years were completely silent. I had absolutely nothing to say. I, I did my work, I did my exams, um, and, and up until about the age of 19, I really had no opinions. <clears throat> now, I, I, I think I've solved that problem. Uh, <laughs> But I, th I think the, I, I thought about silence uh, a great deal, um, particularly in the context of, say, blasphemy laws uh, and freedom of speech. And I wonder why, you know, the Middle East is so um, hesitant to uh, welcome speech. Part of it is because um, we're, we seem to be stuck in um, a kind of a cycle where we regurgitate the same arguments uh, and we think that we're making progress and, and we've, we've contributed to the analysis of the situation. Whereas, in fact, what we've done is, is come up with a conspiracy theory uh, which uh, dis, dis, uh, kind of removes any power that we might have. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a, a dead end. Um, and part of the, uh, the, the, the problem of, of silence is that when you're silent, I feel, you, you begin to lose the ability to, to um, uh, think clearly. Um, and that's why I, I enjoy uh, debate, I enjoy q and A. I I enjoy the, the thinking on my feet, because it provokes me into uh, being a creative uh, and, and sort of committing to a dialogue. If you're silent, there is no dialogue, there is no challenge, there is no uh, uh, creative thinking whatsoever. Um, and so that's why I'm so fearful uh, for you know, uh, many people in the Middle East, is that you are not, um, you know, it's one thing to think destructively, but, the, but, but, but not thinking constructively is also a, a major problem in our part of the world. Yes. So let me open the floor to questions. There's a microphone here, which would be helpful since there's TV. If you would please line up behind the microphone, we'll start taking <coughs> questions from the floor. Okay, thank you. If you could also identify yourself. Uh, my name is Ron Thompson. I was very lucky to catch you on the NPR show, your interview with Terry Gross, and then on The Daily Show also with Trevor Noor. And uh, you made a couple of points that I thought were very good, and I, I was glancing at your book, and they were sort of replicated again. And uh, you asked a question, um, I think it was on page 22, whether it is more ethical to have a strict Islamic system or to have a psychologically healthy Islamic society, and I was going to ask how you how you answer that. I, I, the mm. wording was very powerful. <laughs> yeah, well, I I'm glad you picked up on that, and it's a question that sort of pops into my head every day. Uh, you, there there are certain uh, communities where they focus so much on the the ritual and the regulation of uh, of, uh, of Islam as they imagine it to be that behind the scenes we know that there are people who are having nervous breakdowns who are committing suicide who are taking all kinds of medication and uh, it just occurred to me that you know the the the, the prophet told us that the religion is a religion of ease. It's not meant to be difficult. Um, and I think we've made it difficult. And in making it difficult, we've become obsessive about these tiny little details that have nothing to do really with the, uh, with the, the bulk and the core of the, of the religion. Um, and 
uh, I just I just wondered whether maybe we wouldn't be able to find if if our clerics could think more in terms of psychology. Uh, you know, it's one thing to pray five times a day. It's another thing to pray all night. Um, uh, and you know, you there might even be um, a a religious argument uh, to maintain limits on your own piety and your own religiosity. And there are prophetic traditions to, to, that, that support that uh, view. I just think that you know, we, need, uh, we need to recognize that there is a human psychology behind every Muslim. And we, need, we, we shouldn't push each, of our, uh, push each other to the limit. Um, I didn't expand on that because I really need to have a whole set of uh, uh, discussions about it with, with clerics and, and with, uh, with, with people uh, in, you know, in, 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 the, in the field of psychology. I think it's uh, an angle that's really missing uh, from the way we, we, we look at Islam. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Jessica Wasserman, and um, I've worked in the past as a trade advisor to um, the Dubai Chamber and to the embassy. So I have a lot of friends in the UAE. Um, but uh, I've always tried to talk about politics and about um, religion more openly. And as much as I feel close with them, I've never been able to do that. And so some of your comments are so fascinating to me. But I just assumed that it was more uh, political, like fear of uh, speaking out on these issues. So I wonder whether you didn't speak much about that. I mean, sure. is it really a religious uh, personality more so or is it this you know the two, one of the two uh, uh, well, there, there are tons of reasons to fear um, and what surprises me is that even in Western societies many people are hesitant to speak out there are consequences to, to taking positions um, and uh, you know I, I, I spoke uh, on, on NPR with with uh, Terry Gross and I uh, you know, I, I, I come to the U.S., I don't have an idea of the leanings, uh, political leanings of the people I speak to. Uh, and I speak what I think, uh, feeling quite free, but then I, I get kind of a kind of pushback. Um, and people are expressing surprise that I haven't taken a position that is in accordance or in, that seems to, to, to cohere. Uh, and so that, that for me, that, that has been interesting. Um, why, uh, I will say that, you know, my speaking out um, is not a straightforward matter. Uh, I'm continually thinking about what I'm saying and uh, saying to myself, I will um, bear the consequence. I take responsibility for these words uh, because it's important for me as a, as a human being uh, to have a position to say it with uh, dignity uh, and to stand by it. Now, if people don't like it, well, then I can withdraw. Uh, but I do want to put a set of ideas out there and let people think about them if they want. If they, if they decide, as, as you know, one of my close relatives has decided, that these ideas are beyond the pale, uh, so, so be it. But I, I think I owe myself and, uh, and, and my children uh, a kind of an obligation to, to provide as much clarity as I can um, uh, uh, to them. And, and the problem here also is that there is a kind of an Islamic perspective that says uh, the world is static. If you are in the right religious frame of mind, you need worry about nothing because you have everything right. Yeah. Actually, the world is an incredibly dynamic place, and we've got to continually re-engage as, I mean, in my case, as a Muslim, with the world. Uh, and so it's a, it's a daily, weekly, monthly task. It isn't that I, I, I pray my five prayers a day and that's it. You know, there's no thought necessary again. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, my name is Dan Dolan. I would like your observation on a comment that I, or uh, some observations that I've read by a French philosopher whose name I've unfortunately just forgotten that the uh, right way to look at what is happening with ISIS is to analogize it to the Protestant Reformation in Europe in the 15th and 16th century that, it, that it's basically a reaction of people who see religion being used to benefit some people and to uh, not permit uh, explorations of thought as such as in the 15th and 16th, in the Renaissance happened, people began thinking, well, I can do this and, you know, maybe this Maybe the sun moves, or maybe the earth moves, or who knows what moves. And perhaps the idea would be that his theory was that the uh, same forces are at work in the Islamic world, 
and that it's uh, quite foolish to think about using military means to deal with that. Very interesting question. When you got up, I thought you were leaving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for, <laughs> for appearing there again. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, ISIS, ISIS, I think, uh, just sort of very briefly, ISIS um, is, a, is a set of ideas. Uh, and, you know, ISIS as an organization can be destroyed. Uh, the ideas haven't uh, been destroyed. Um, we can try to discredit those ideas. Uh, I'm not sure we're, we're really making a, uh, a serious push there, um, you know, globally. Uh, it's... Uh, I, so, so um, I think of ISIS as a state of mind uh, and a, a particularly easy one uh, to, to absorb and to follow. Uh, it's tempting, uh, it's, it's very simple, it, it's very reductive and it makes things black and white. I, I, don't, I don't know enough about the, uh, the 15th, 16th century uh, religious kind of uh, upheavals, but I, would, I, I do think it's very interesting that ISIS comes along almost as a set of, um, it's an upstart. You know? it's, uh, it, it, what they're doing is essentially they're challenging the traditional um, uh, religious authorities, uh, whether in, in Saudi Arabia or in, uh, in Egypt, um, and they're saying we uh, have the right to um, talk about these issues and legislate on these issues and, and take Islam forward. And I've attended a number of conferences where there have been uh, a, a great deal of uh, clerics who um, are, are promoting the idea of peace within Islam, and it's, you know, it's all fantastic. But what I noticed about their positions was their criticisms of ISIS aren't about doctrine. They're about who has the right to the, this clerical authority. And I thought, well, this is perhaps why we need, as, as um, you know, sort of non-scholars of Islam, this is why we need to get into t in touch with the clerics to say, you're fighting over power with a terrorist organization, but you're not, you're not actually uh, interested in us as, as individuals, as ethical agents. You just want to take back that authority and tell us what to do. So in structure, you aren't really any different from uh, uh, what, what these people have done. Um, and, and that's why I think that there has to be, the, the, we need a set of uh, clerics who are o open and ready to have dialogue, uh, respectful dialogue with 21st century people who have a broad education uh, and who, who want to be, uh, you know, sort of ethical agents in, in, in the Arab world. Can I follow it up by a little jump into geopolitics? Because you have a, a unique perspective in that you are, you have been in Russia now for eight years. You know presumably a lot about how Russia's government thinks about things. You're from the Middle East, and you spend time here and in the West. After Syria, or maybe Syria is not over, but the, the, the crisis in Syria, and with ISIS seemingly in retreat in Iraq and Syria, what do you see as sort of the next stage of um, the ideological struggle within Islam and where the West is involved, the West, but I'm going to include Russia, but then yes. in that region. Well, I'm not going to answer your question because it's difficult, so I'm going to kind of go off on a tangent. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think where the, where the West is, is deeply involved with us in the, in the Arab and Muslim world is uh, on, on the question, uh, the, the, the twin questions of Islamophobia and, and extremism. And very often uh, we Muslims will, you know, uh, voice our concerns about Islamophobia, which, you know, they, these are concerns that are very, very legitimate. And, and I would say that, you know, we need, we need to fight Islamophobia. But even within the context of, you know, fighting Islamophobia, we should actually think about all of the other minority groups, uh, whether in the U.S. or, or elsewhere where and even in, in the Arab uh, and Muslim worlds, and we need to think about how we are ourselves deal with minorities. Um, and, and then uh, I, I really am very sort of concerned that I sometimes feel that um, we focus too much on the Islamophobia angle uh, to the detriment of you know, internal discussion within the Muslim community about extremism. So I think these things uh, are linked but should also, in a sense, be separated. We, we talk about Islamophobia, but we shouldn't use it as an excuse to hide some of the very very, very uh, serious and critical issues that the, the Islamic community is facing globally. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have yeah. a question. Um, my name is Alona Al Qayyam, and uh, I'm a brand builder and I do marketing. Um, in 2011, I did a talk at South by Southwest called Rebranding Islam. And the reason why I did it was because um, at the time there was the, uh, mos the mosque being built across the street yes. from. Uh, World Trade Center, I'm, and I'm Jewish. I have a lot of Muslim friends, 
and um, like I really wanted to defend it, you know, I really wanted to support it because I felt like that's religious freedom, like, and, um, but I realized I didn't hear a lot of uh, Muslims in America, and I'm making a generalization, but in my world, that were speaking out against terrorism. So I put together this talk, and I, the, uh, the wife of the imam, Daisy Khan, uh, she, she came, and um, one of, uh, someone that worked with Reza Aslan came, and um, had a, a, a moderator there, and it was a really polarizing discussion, because again, I'm not a theologian or anything, but I think what was important to me is, is, is the state of understanding, and how can, uh, Muslims in America bridge that gap between what other Americans think of Islam, which is, you know, fanatics. And, and so that was wonderful. Years later, there are a lot of discussions, and the clerics in, in America, to, in, my, in my view, have been opening up the discussions and having those conversations and speaking out against terrorism and really... Uh, in small ways changing the way Americans view Islam. But I guess my question is, you know, it's still, there, the, the, there's not a great stride, you know, it hasn't changed that much. And I, and I, and I heard Reza Aslan, uh, you know, s he has a new television show coming up a, 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 about like a, like Modern Family, but for I Islam, you know, to normalize you know, instead of normalizing hom homosexuality, normalizing Islam by, you, you know, having that kind of sort of in pop culture. And I feel like that might be the only way. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you, when September 11th took place, uh, I, was, I was horrified. And I thought, well, you know, I've been thinking about um, radical Islam from the age of about 14, 15. Uh, so the, the, the early 80s, or mid-80s. And I thought, finally, uh, September 11th has to be a turning point for the global Islamic community, and we really need to be thinking about what, 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 is allowed to, what has been allowed to be said uh, to our children, to our neighbors in, in, in our mosques. Uh, you know, because traditionally, at least in the areas in the mosques that I went to, there was a lot of angry uh, uh, um, preaching, uh, a lot of politicized preaching. Uh, and I thought that the reaction of the Arab world would be to, to begin to look into it, uh, um, in, uh, into these issues. But the reaction was really, uh, we have to change the image of Islam in the West. Um, you know, I, I have respect for branding, but if the, the product is, is not, it's not clear mm -hmm. where we really stand on these things. We can, we can spend a ton of money on, on, on kind of glossy adverts and brochures and, and, and you know, TV series. Uh, but if, when I go back home and I speak to, you know, um, uh, people at the mosque, and we ourselves are wondering, where are we going with all of this? Uh, uh, where are our clerics t are taking us? Um, then that's, that's the problem. And I think that this is a long overdue discussion within our own communities. No? But I, sorry, just one quick thing. Sure. Um, but I guess what, when I was hearing you talk before, is it, it sounds like, I mean, I'm Jewish, there's different strains of Judaism. There's reform, there's sure. conservative. I don't know if you were doing, it, it sounds like every, every Muslim is, the religiosity is to the extreme, but that's not true. No, it, it's not true. Right. Uh, I, I agree with that. But what I'm saying is, and people, in, I'm, it's an invitation to um, uh, the, the, my fellow Muslims to, to take re more responsibility. Uh, and I know that there are Muslims who are cultural Muslims, who are not particularly devout, who, you know, identify with the faith, but, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of a warm, cozy feeling. But we do have a bunch of people within the faith um, who are taking an extremely radical line and who have an agenda to convert the rest of us to it. They're ready to take our children. And so that's what I'm, I'm talking about. I take responsibility because I have to say to my child, you don't understand that ISIS is actually a, a, an evil organization because they're talking to you through your teacher at school or through, through the internet. And so I think, great, if you want to be a, 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 an American Muslim uh, who wants to go to Starbucks and go to the bookshop, go to work, and not worry about the direction of Islam globally, well then, that's your choice. I don't think you're taking responsibility like that, but it's up to you. Um, and then I also think that uh, the, 
a lot of people are saying that, you know, in, in Trump's America, Muslims should be afraid. Um, I'm like, well, you know, there are a lot of people who may be afraid, you know, historically over the last sort of 100 years, uh, different communities in, in the U.S. Um, but, but communities get together and take advantage of the laws that are, you know, part of the Constitution uh, and, and actually work to uh, establish a position for themselves in the community. Um, and that's what I'd like to see. Not, uh, uh, I, mean, I, I think it's a little self-indulgent to say, well, you know, I'm a Muslim and those people don't have anything to do with me. They have everything to do with us. Uh, hello, my name is Daya. I'm a resident in Maryland. Um, I was wondering, to build on what you were saying before about um, like American Muslims' ability to uh, engage in this internal dialogue, um, are, are there any plans to translate your book into Arabic or Urdu? Um, and can you share, I know a lot of uh, human rights activists or uh, just uh, lay Muslims on, on social media are having, you know, these informal exchanges with, you know, people more extremists under very trying circumstances. Can you share any, like, organizations that are already trying to do that kind of dialogue in a somewhat systematic way? Uh. Yeah, I mean, there, there are organizations, um, but, you know, everybody's sort of feeling their way forward. Uh, yeah. You know, there are organizations in the UK. Um, I, I'm involved with the Center for Counter-Radicalization uh, in, in London at King's College. Um, but that's m m doing more of an analysis of uh, the, the kind of mentality that is behind uh, extremism. Uh, the book, uh, yes, I, I have got an offer from a, an Arab publisher, and I'm, uh, I'm very keen to see the book in Arabic. Um, and... Uh, yesterday I got the news that the, there's a Turkish publisher that wants the book as well. Uh, Pakistan has not called, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was very impressed. The Taiwanese would like, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, and the offer was to do it in complex Chinese. So I'm, I'm going to try and figure out what that's all about. The, uh, the, Just I believe, Taiwan. Yeah. <laughs> get the mainland. Yeah, uh, Hong Kong as well. Yeah, so... Um, I, you know, friends in Russia have said that they'd like to see it in Russian, um, and I do have a German and a, and a Spanish uh, 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 contract. Um, you know, th these, these are early days as far as I'm concerned. I'd, I'd like to see the kind of reaction, um, and uh, again, I just, I, I really want to stress that this is not a prescriptive kind of text. This is just a text to, that, that asks people to begin to uh, engage with a set of questions. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll get some clarity. Maybe there are some straightforward answers. You know? Um, as, as, as some people have offered me. <laughs> Hi, my name is Wajriha. Um, Hi. I'm all thank you. Um, the Muslim experience in the West uh, can be quite different from the Muslim experience in Muslim-majority countries. Um, the way Muslim youth in the West um, approach Islam, um, our issues and our problems um, are different. Um, even our clerics. Um, are very different and um, you know I mean I, I sitting here listening to you I had some trouble trying to relate to a lot of the things that you were saying um, as someone whose local imam is an advocate for gender equality and advocates um, joining hands with the LGBTQ com community here um, like I was I was struggling with a lot of the things you were saying so I'm wondering your book letters to a Muslim exactly which Muslims does it address even within Muslim majority countries, um, the Muslim experience in Indonesia will be different from Muslims in Pakistan, which will be different from Muslims in UAE or somewhere else. Um, so, who is this targeting, really? Well, I, I should have named it letters to my older son, because even my younger son will not find uh, absolutely everything relevant to him. Uh, you know, it's 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 a set of questions. You, uh, you know, for example, the, the the question of sexuality. It's impossible to open up that question in the Arab world. Um, it's impossible to open up in, in, uh, to, the, to those ideas. Uh, I mean, they are. If you came to the Arab world and you said, you know, we're interested in promoting uh, uh, gay rights, um, they would be horrified and they would laugh at you. Uh, even though everybody knows that you know sexuality is is, is very diverse in the Arab world, uh, in, in the heartland of Islam. Um, I, I'm not saying that I address every single young Muslim, uh, and I'm not saying that every single piece of uh, advice or invitation to think in the book uh, is relevant to every single Muslim. Uh, I, I would be, uh, there are 27 letters, I believe. I'd be happy if, if you know, each uh, uh, Muslim who picks up the book finds three of the letters of relevance. 
Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not out to preach. I'm, I'm just inviting uh, a discussion. Uh, and you're right, the, the, the American experience of Islam is, is, is different. Um, um, so maybe the American Muslims should just declare their independence for the global community of Muslims and, and you know, go, go your own path. Um, there are a lot of people who are, are uh, pushing a radical agenda that says the global Islamic Ummah is one, you must fall in line, and one day they will come to the Muslims of America and say, you've got to fall in line with this, uh, this great project we have. So you need to be aware of how other Muslims are looking at the Muslim community of America. So that's, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's also a, a kind of a cautionary um, a, a book. I'm asking my son to be aware of the potential manipulative intentions of others yeah, in the name of religion. So I hope that was okay. Yes, okay. <laughs> Speaking of manipulative intentions, um, I'm an educator in museums with a background in Islamic art and Arabic studies. And I also taught math, science, and religion in Catholic school for two years. Um, and in that time, I did a lot of thinking about what and how I was being asked to teach. So um, you say that before you come to the text, speaking specifically about the Quran, um, you should discover your position on life. And I haven't read your book yet, so my apologies if you already addressed this. <laughs> but. Um, at what point and in what ways do you suggest we teach children about religion? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. Uh, you know, I, I, I know how we shouldn't teach them, but I don't know really how to go forward. And <sighs> there, there, there seems to be a kind of a, a growing uh, trend, uh, at least in the kind of Muslim communities that I, I um, mix in, um, to, well, we, we mix up education with indoctrination. And so we create um, uh, model Muslims uh, this high. Uh, and, you know, I, I, th I think that's unfair. I think that it limits the, their options. Um, uh, and I think it limits the, uh, the, the potential uh, kind of... Uh, uh, I, I, it limits the potential of Islam as a religion because it, it locks a child into a particular worldview. It doesn't give you know, the kind of freedom to, to, to think more broadly. Uh, and so that, that's, that's what worries me. Um, no, you got me stumped. I'm going to have to come back and think about that. Yeah? Thank you. <laughs> and my apologies. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Mikhail Rashid. I'm actually a clinical psychologist. Um, so my uh, question... What's your diagnosis? <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you have? Um, and I'm also a Muslim. And I was you know, raised a Muslim. My uh, parents... Um, experienced Islam originally through the Nation of Islam and then um, kind of joined the more mainstream uh, uh, expression of Islam, uh, Sunni Islam. So that was certainly my uh, worldview growing up. But again, you know, we were raised in a way that um, appreciated multiculturalism and, you know, um, religious plurality and, and valued that. Um, m my question is, is, is sort of two-pronged, right? Uh, my observation as a psychologist is that Oftentimes, um, unfortunately, our uh, clerics and religious leaders do a very poor job of counseling. Uh, and um, so I, I guess the question is, how do we go about sort of changing that from the inside out? Um, and uh, I guess as a follow on, how, you know, um, any advice on, um, you know, folks like me that are just sort of, you know, community members as far as going about changing that and also going about, you um, uh, kind of uh, holding them accountable or encouraging um, people who are clearly having some mental health issues to sort of go about seeking it, seeking to uh, address those. What, what, what you made me think about is is the way in which clerics traditionally view their own function that that they are um, the ones who possess the knowledge uh, and essentially that religious knowledge is the only really relevant knowledge. Um, and that if you are not a scholar of Islam in the way that they are, that you don't have a right to engage in a discussion, um, that if you have a suggestion, well, you know, interesting, but keep it to yourself. And what I'm saying is that, you know, we need to expand the notion of, of the scholar of Islam and, and the, 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 the people who have the authority uh, to, to speak about these issues, to widen it, to include 
historians, psychologists, uh, uh, economists, um, uh, people who have a, a, a greater understanding, and and to say to the clerics, look, you know, you're still you're still the one who understands the the, the moral kind of uh, intricacies of Islam, but to make those kinds of decisions today and to help Muslims uh, move forward, we need a much greater number of people coming together and informing the decisions or the suggestions, the recommendations of the of the clerical uh, and, and religious classes. And so what I'm saying is that, that knowledge, uh, uh, our knowledge of ourselves has developed so much over the last thousand years, and yet the clerical class seems to be stuck with a, a view of how knowledge works from the 10th century. Absolutely. So, completely thank you very much. So one last question, and thank you very much. Um, actually, my question is also kind of related to the gentleman before the psychology part of it. You had mentioned here in the preface part, that's how far I have gotten since your book is released. <laughs> With work in grad school, it's a little hard. I uh, apologize you're, for that. No, that's fine. Uh, uh, you're, you're taking your time. You're enjoying yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a part you mentioned where you said that uh, my friends and I wondered why, why committing suicide was seen as a suicide attacker, was seen as a great, uh, well, committing suicide in general was seen as a great sin against Allah if done for reasons such as sadness or unhappiness, but it was a greater sac sacrifice if it was done as a suicide attack to kill to uh, kill enemy. Of course, I agree with that statement and that question, but I, I was intrigued by the choice of words of, you know, committing suicide. It was a great sin um, if somebody committed suicide as a result of sadness or unhappiness, um, which led me th to think, I don't know if it was a conscious effort on your part, but the narrative that I have heard is that when you talk about depression-related suicide, and depression is, you know, one of the mental illnesses. Sure. Um, the narrative that I hear from some school of thought is that if you truly practice Islam the right way, you would never be depressed. Or that um, you must not be practicing it right, because if you did, it would not have happened to you. So, uh, so I wondered if the choice of words that um, suicide as a result of sadness or unhappiness uh, did the word depression come into while you were writing it, or it, just, it was just a coincidence that it just... No, uh, yeah, well, I was certainly th thinking of depression. I was certainly, certainly thinking of a whole set of, of, of issues that have led to you know, people in the Middle East committing suicide. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons people commit suicide. Um, and and uh, I, I, f I find it kind of objectionable that uh, uh, we're, we're told that you can't do it because you know, uh, life is a gift from God, but you know, in the case where you're doing something for the, the, the global Islamic uh, um, it's okay. Um, it, it, you know, for, for me, it's incoherent and nonsensical. I think also, I, th I think I say somewhere in, in, in the book that the whole idea of sacrificing your life uh, for God, uh, it is a great sacrifice. I mean, it is a very, very important sacrifice. You can't make any sacrifices after that. Uh, and I think that's one of the problems is that, you know, if you're interested in, in making sacrifices for, for your religion or for Allah, then stick around. Yeah? Stick around for as long as possible and make the world around you a much better place. Uh, and that's what I'd, I'd like to see our cleric saying. Yeah. Um, there's, there's something else I, I, w I wanted to say to you, but it's, it's, it's disappeared uh, from my mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, Omar, this, this has been tremendous, and you know, I think on that note that stick around and make, make more sacrifices, I, mean, I think all of us <laughs> can endorse the idea. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a remarkable and wide-ranging conversation, and I, I commend the book to all of you if you haven't had a chance to read it. Um, it's, it's eloquent. It's uh, thoughtful. And as you can tell, the author is also very concerned about issues that are, I think, uh, central to our time. So I hope you all have a chance to read it and thank, and thank him uh, for his participation here tonight. Thank, thank you. And of course, because you all do want to read it now, we have copies available um, up at the front, and Omar will be happy to sign them up here. Thank you all so much for coming out.